Now, for many Britons, Australia is a place held in deep affection. I'm one of them. I know enough Australians and I've spent enough time there over the last few years uh, to know the feeling is mutual for many. It may be at the other end of the world, but the ties of family and friends, as well as the presence there of a culture that seems, at least on the surface, so similar to our own, means Australia and Australians feel close and familiar. At the very least, Australia looks like, and indeed calls itself, a lucky country, the lucky country. Astonishing natural beauty, absurdly rich in natural resources, uh, surfing beaches to die for, if that's your cup of tea. And yet, and yet, in recent weeks and months, many of us have looked on in mounting horror as footage has emerged of Australian police applying increasingly violent tactics in the face of those citizens protesting about some of the longest quarantines and lockdowns in the world. Rubber bullets, pepper spray sticks, clenched fists and boots. Is Australia the place so many of us think, or is there another side we are just now glimpsing? My next guest is Australian-born lawyer and political commentator Helen Dale, and I can't think of anyone better informed to explain to us just what's going on down under. Hello, Helen. It's great to see you. Good evening, Neil. How are you? I'm um, good. Full disclosure, Helen and I are chums. We, we know each other quite well. So we've had some of this conversation uh, before over the preceding days and weeks. Helen, what we've been watching in recent days uh, and weeks, is this a side of Australia that you recognise and understand oh, yes. the rest of us are surprised. Yes, I do. And a lot of people in Britain are shocked, are being shocked by it because a characteristic of the whole country of Australia, but which is particularly serious in Victoria, has been exposed and become a global news story. And a lot of people, this is outside the Victorian Parliament, that photo that has just been shown to viewers, uh, this is a, one of the running fights between members of the CFMEU and the Victorian police. It is very bad in Victoria. It is worse in Victoria than it is in the other states. But there is a long tradition going back before Federation, which in Australia was in 1901, of very authoritarian policing. And the line that I like to use is from an Australian academic, Professor Katie Barnett, at the University of Melbourne, where she says, always remember, Australians may be the descendants of convicts, but they are also the descendants of their jailers. Now, the authoritarian policing in the other states has been less serious in recent years than in Victoria. And there are particular contexts for that. Basically, you had across a number of Australian states, but particularly in New South Wales and Queensland. And by way of background, I should explain that I grew up in Queensland and I was a, a young girl in Queensland when a man called Joe Bjorki Peterson was Premier. And it is generally recognised by political scientists now that Queensland in the 1970s and the 1980s was the closest that a white a, a member of the white British Commonwealth came to true authoritarian government. It was almost impossible because of an electoral gerrymander for the opposition to win government, no matter how popular they were. It had terrifying police corruption. And then in 1987, as a result of some brave and intrepid journalists and lawyers, this was exposed to the wider public and there was an inquiry known as the Fitzgerald Inquiry. Now, that happened in 1987. Fortunately, the recommendations were implemented and the Queensland police were by and large cleaned up. Then again, in 1995, the same process had to happen in New South Wales with what was known as the Wood Royal Commission, where there was extraordinary police corruption and also violence and abuse of individuals in New South Wales prisons. And there was a running joke that New South Wales provided the best police that money could buy. You can take that any way you like. Why, uh, have, we, Helen, why, have, we been, why, why have we been so unaware? As I, as I said in, by way of introduction, you know, so many of us are so fond of and feel so connected to Australia. Uh, how has it come to pass that, that this, this aspect of, uh, of the Australian character and, the, and, the, and Australian society has, has passed us by? In large part, 
and I, I'm very grateful for you tweeting the article from Standpoint magazine that I wrote at the end of last year when this was first starting to become an issue. State governments and the federal government in Australia, although the worst behaviour has been from state governments, have been able to get away with a great deal more authoritarianism than it would be possible in the United Kingdom or, and certainly in the United States, simply because Australians are very, very good at running things. Australia has what economists call high state capacity. Before the uh, coronavirus recession, which was very, very shallow, uh, to give you an idea, in Australia, there had been no recession in the proper technical economic sense of the term recession, two, terms of, uh, uh, two quarters of negative growth in Australia since 1991. In 1991, I think I was 17, maybe 18, I'm not sure. But yes, I was a teenager. I can barely remember what that recession was like. So the global financial crisis didn't touch Australia. If you read the, the journalist uh, Barry Weiss, the American journalist, when she was still at the New York Times, she was seconded to Australia for about six, 12 months. And she wrote a number of articles about her experience there. And she said, this country is terrifying because everything works, so including the government. And the comment that she made was the libertarian or classical liberal argument that someone like Ronald Reagan or Margaret Thatcher could make, the most terrifying sentence in the English language, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. You couldn't <laughs> use that to scare Australians because Australians treat their government as this giant public utility. And as I explain in the Standpoint piece, which you very kindly tweeted for everybody to, ha to have a read of it, it allows the government to get away with a lot more authoritarianism because there is far less record of government institutional failure in Australia than there is in the UK or France or the United States or so on and so forth. Australia is a very high trust society and it has trusted its government because the government has a track record of being able to do things that other, other governments can't do. Now, the one that's famous in Britain is the immigration policy, the points-based immigration. You're not supposed to, economists argue for years, that it's not possible to centrally plan an immigration system. And then Australia just calmly came along, put its hand up and said, you're wrong. Is, <laughs> and that's literally this, this, how it happened. What you, think, what you seem to be saying, Helen, is that, that, that uh, Australia has very strict, very, very strict parents. But the, but the children of Australia are prepared to put up with that because it's a really nice house and, and you know, everything works really well and there's lots of hot showers. You know, it, it, it's high function. There's a very, it, very good joke, which I'm going to steal from him now, and I hope he doesn't mind it because he's a comedian. His name's Carl Benjamin, and he describes Australia as the world's largest and best appointed open-air prison. <laughs> And I think there's an element of truth in that. So, given that, I mean, we're, we're straying into light-hearted territory here, and, and, and yet, after all, what we're looking at coming out of the state of Victoria is genuinely frightening. Is this doing fundamental damage? I mean, are we now talking about, after all, you know, this happy century and more of, of people being ready to accept, uh, you know, close to authoritarian government? Is that relationship in danger of being fractured? Or is it isolated to that one state? I do think in this particular instance, it's isolated to a large degree in Victoria. Victoria is the worst governed of the Australian states. It is the only state that had its quarantine system in 2020 collapse. And it's also the city of Melbourne, the capital of Victoria, has had the longest period of lockdown of any city in the developed world. It's as of today, 237 days. You've got to remember that other parts of the country have had no lockdown or as little as three days. So Victoria, as a re result of its police, never having had the findings of an inquiry, which was actually completed only a couple of years ago, implemented because the pandemic came along. Victoria finally had its police inquiry and it found when it, the reporting, the Royal Commission reporting was brought down, that not only were the police corrupt, 
they'd managed to corrupt the judicial system as well. What had happened was you had the police turning solicitors and barristers who were supposed to be acting for criminal defendants, informing on those same defendants. And the most notorious part of this, one particular barrister, a woman called Nicola Gobbo, who for a long time was known as Lawyer X and has now disappeared because she had to be hidden, basically had to go through the equivalent of the Witness Protection Programme. Thousands of convictions were unsafe. So this was worse than New South Wales and Queensland, where it wasn't just corrupt and aggressive police. It was corrupt and aggressive police where their behaviour had managed to percolate out into the legal system. That report was brought down just before the pandemic started off in Australia, and none of the recommendations, not a single one of those recommendations by that Royal Commission report in response to the Lawyer X inquiry have been implemented. So you are dealing with an institutionally corrupt and violent police force since 1994, known to have been the most violent police force in Australia, something that's quite well documented when they raided a nightclub, a, a no, notoriously a gay and trans nightclub, and all these people were subjected to strip searches and cavity searches. In 1994, I remember, because I was a university student at the time, that being reported in the Queensland press, in the main newspaper in Queensland, the Courier Mail. And basically the tone of it was this typically Australian and very Queensland, oh, well, at least it's not our police that are the worst in the country anymore. It's Victoria's now. It's so just you've this... got this un unsolved issue with policing in Victoria that has been ridden on the back of a 100 years plus history, two, probably 200 years history of history of authoritarian policing. And because of the pandemic, it has been exposed to a global audience and the world is getting to see what happens when Australian policing goes wrong. One, one last question before I, before I have to wrap this up. Helen, does this, this if, if Victoria is a bad apple, let's say, in the barrel, does it compromise the integrity of the whole federation? You know, is that, does it does it put does it put cracks into the whole face of Australia that, that that could see fracture? Well, this is another point that Professor Barnett makes, and also uh, Professor Sarah Joseph, who used to be in uh, Melbourne as well, but has actually left. She's now at a university in in Queensland. Uh, two legal, distinguished legal academics, one a private lawyer and one a human rights lawyer. Professor Joseph Sarah Joseph is a human rights lawyer. Both of them have made the observation that. First of all, the way the rest of Australia turned on Victoria when its quarantine system collapsed. And now the problem with its police and low state capacity. And now, of course, these huge internal fights between what's supposed to be a left-wing government, but also a left-wing anti-lockdown union, the CFNEU, the Construction, Forestry, Mining and Energy Union. And I've tweeted some photographs taken of, of their protest. You see, you've got these huge fractures in Victoria and Professor Barnett and Professor Joseph have made the comment a couple of times that this is undermining the Federation. And the thing is, that's dangerous in Australia because Australia is super federal in a way that the United States is not. It is possible by referendum in Australia for a state to leave peacefully. And this very nearly happened once in Australian history. In 1933, uh, West Australia held a referendum and the majority voted to leave the Australian Federation. And the only reason that was not implemented was because there literally wasn't enough money in either the federal or the state government coffers to do the setup for it because it was at the height of the Great Depression. So this is really quite dangerous. And a lot of Victorians are feeling very picked on and very persecuted. They are conscious that they are that, that they look bad compared to the rest of the country. They're conscious that there, there are problems with the police in the country. But there's also, too, the wider phenomenon, although it has broken down now once the CFMEU membership, if not the, the leadership of the union, but once the CFMEU became involved and started to say that this is very authoritarian policing, you've got people coming onto building sites, we're being harassed and so on and so forth. Um, so this has started to break down now, but until the CFMEU became involved, you had a situation where you had a group of people who I would only describe as the lockdown left, where in Victoria they were attempting to portray Dan Andrews as some hero and some marvellous person and basically that he could do no wrong. And 
kept the peace. You didn't have much in the way of a violent protest. You like you didn't see any nasty nonsense at our Black Lives Matter protests or anything like that. They're all completely peaceful. The wheels have fallen off now, partly because of the involvement of the trade union. Now, trade unions in Australia are still very powerful, and partly because these are people who've been in lockdown for 237 days. That's longer than London's, London. It's longer than Paris. It's longer than New York. They've run out of patience. They've just had it up to here, basically. That's probably the best way of putting it. Welcome to the GB News YouTube channel. You can watch us live 24 hours a day, catch up on your favourite shows, and join in the conversation in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and you'll never miss any of our exclusive content.